Good evening and welcome to the San Bernardino City Council and Redevelopment Agency meeting of October 26, 2010. Uh, call the meeting to order and ask for roll call, please. Council Member O'Connell. Here. Vice Mayor Medina. Here. Mayor Ruane. Here. Council Member Ibera. Here. Council Member Salazar. Here. And I can't see, but do we have flowers in front? Then I'd like to thank the San Bernardino <laughs> Garden Club. <laughs> thank you very much. They always provide uh, a floral arrangement for our meetings. Um, we've had the roll call, Pledge of Allegiance. Our city attorney, please. Lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The item number three announcements. There will be a town hall meeting regarding the Glenview fire recovery efforts this Friday, October 29th at 6.30 p.m. at St. Robert's Church, uh, 1380 Crystal Springs Road in San Bruno. And also, we also have the, uh, Rico, could you mention the Mr. Town Mayor, board, please? One moment. Al please. Yes, One sir. Moment. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very quickly, uh, for the Project Pride Committee of uh, <coughs> Council Member Salazar and I, this uh, Friday, starting at 3.30, is the first parade. 4.15 is the second parade for its annual Halloween parade at the shops of Tamfran Mall. So everyone is welcome uh, to participate. We'll be downstairs by the escalator, and that's where the parade will begin. All right, Mr. Lubke? Yes, uh, Alan Lubke, Fleetwood Drive. Will the town hall meeting regarding the Glenview fire recovery efforts be televised on channel one? It will, not live. It'll be recorded and replayed. Be recorded and then broadcast. Yeah. Yes. And I would like to, and to suggest that a handout be made available at the town hall meeting showing the 30-inch gas pipelines running through San Bruno. The maps provided by PG&E on their website do not provide enough detail for a basis for public discussion of the issues. Thank you. We have some presentations this evening, which is always nice. Uh, I'd like to call on Mr. Michael Joseph from Walgreens. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Joseph. I'm the store manager of the Westlake store Walgreens in Daly City. I'm also community leader for six stores in the immediate uh, area around my store, one of which is the San Bruno store, and I brought with me Earl Edwards, who happens to be the manager of our San Bruno store. I must say that it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you monies that we have collected from our communities uh, by store management and its employees uh, for the uh, victims of the uh, San Bruno fire. Our hearts and thoughts go out to them. Also, I'd like to add that if there's anything that we at Walgreens can do for our community, please call on us. Please call on either Earl or myself, and uh, we'll be more than glad to be there for you. Wonderful. Thank Thanks. you very much. Uh, I'd like to come down. Earl, would you like to say something? Sure. Hello. Thank you again for having us. Uh, my name is Earl Edwards, and I am the current manager of the San Bruno Walgreens. Um, I would be proud to be your contact uh, for anything, just like Mike said, for anything that you would need as a community, uh, for whatever we can do, please let us know. Thank That's you. Wonderful. Let me come down and accept that on behalf of the council and the city. <clears throat> Walgreens has been a, a great part of our community for a long time, so uh, you're on Channel 1 Live, so I'm sure you're going to be getting a lot of calls on your offer. <laughs> so, um, uh, we also have uh, Mr. Patrick Ahern from Equinox. Patrick? Good evening. 
Good evening. My name is Patrick Ahern. I'm the general manager of Equinox Fitness in San Mateo. Uh, we have a good number of employees and many more members who are uh, residents of the San Bruno area. Um, so as this, um, um, the, the need for this came about, people stepped up and thought we should do something to, to show our support for the community. So um, we, had an on, we had a member event coming up anyway, and the personal training department stepped up and suggested that we do what came to be known as a push-up-a-thon to raise money for the city. And basically the way that uh, took place was they went around to our members and asked for their, their pledge, their support uh, in, in the fundraising efforts. And for each push-up that they could do in one minute, they would contribute whatever they committed to. So 25 cents some people, $10 other people. So all told, uh, we were able to raise about $3,300, and so we have that here for you tonight. Wow, wonderful. wonderful. Thank you. I wouldn't be able to give that much. The outpouring of generosity from all over. I can't just say San Bruno, it's not just the peninsula, it's the state and around the country has been uh, overwhelming. And uh, we can't say any more than thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Review of the agenda. Any items on the agenda? Irene, would you uh, like to say something? I, I just wanted to ask a silly question. Do you know how many push ups that <laughs> represented? <laughs> Push-ups. Say that again there, Patrick, please. <laughs> so I was saying I was surprised to find that some people were able to pull off over 100 push-ups in one minute. Wow. That's so wow. I think the average was in the, in the 60 to 70 range, but a couple people got, got way up there. So all told, I'd say maybe seven to 800 push-ups. Please, please convey our thanks. <laughs> Will do. That's great. Wonderful. Okay, review the agenda. Questions on the approval of the minutes of the regular city council meeting of October the 12th, 2010, and the special city council meeting of October 19th, 2010. Changes, errors, omissions. Mr. Lubke. Alan Lubke, Fleetwood Drive. <clears throat> I see there are minutes of the special city council meeting of October the 19th. I would like to have answers to questions regarding the differences between a regular city council meeting and a special city council meeting. What are the notification requirements for a regular city council meeting? And by what media are these notifications made? What are the notifications for a special city council meeting? Are these any different than a regular city council meeting? And by what media are these notifications made? Were the requirements met for notification for the special city council meeting of October the 19th. And finally, what is the policy on televising city council meetings, both regular and special? What is the policy on replaying the, te the televised meetings for a regular city council meeting and special city council meeting? All right, is that all? Yes. Okay, we'll get an answer to your question to the city Mr. attorney, Mayor, Mr. Lenz. Uh, pursuant to state law under the Brown Act, um, a special meeting is required to have 24 hours notice before the start of the special meeting. Uh, it's put on the city's website and the agenda for that meeting has to be posted. Uh, there's no requirement that any city council meeting be televised, but I understand that the policy of the city has been not to televise special meetings. For regular meetings, the agenda has to be posted uh, 72 hours ahead of the meeting. Uh, and it's also put on the city's website, as I understand, and the city's policy is to televise its regular meetings. Did answer your What questions? if you don't have a website? Well, it's posted at City Hall, and it's posted in the library. Thank you. So regarding the minutes, any other errors, omissions, questions? They'll stand approved as uh, submitted. Consent calendar. All items are considered routine or implemented earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless requested by a council member, citizen, or staff. 
questions on the consent calendar or action? Through Chair, I'll move to uh, uh, poll 7D. Okay, item 7D. Any action on the remainder? Move to approve the remainder of the consent items. Second. Motion second on the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item 7D, accept letters of resignation from personnel board member David Thomas, Culture and Arts Commissioner Melody Tobin, and Citizens Crime Prevention member Carol Campbell. Declare committee member vacancies and direct the city clerk to initiate the process for appointment of new members. Mr. Mayor, uh, it's always my pleasure to thank uh, volunteers uh, for their service in these uh, in these committees. Dave Thomas is well known and so is Melody Tobin. Also, uh, Carol Campbell, a uh, relatively new person on the committee, uh, she's resigning through health reasons. We wish her well in, uh, uh, in the coming, coming weeks and months and uh, just thank them all for their service. And uh, uh, with that, I will uh, move to accept 7D. Second. Motion second to accept item 7D. Any question? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Carried. Item 8 is a public hearing. Notices have been published, posted, and mailed. Hold a public hearing, waive the first reading, and introduce an ordinance of the City of San Bruno amending and restating the development plan for Crystal Springs Terrace Apartments and adopt a resolution approving a plan development permit and architectural review permit. Staff, please. We'll hear staff, please. I'll, I'll open it up to the public in a few minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. The application before you is for changes to the Crystal Springs Terrace Apartments Complex, which is located at 2000 Crystal Springs Road. Um, I'm sure you're probably aware um, or familiar with the project, but I just wanted to give you a couple of highlights and orient you a little bit to the project site. The complex currently has 433 units. 628 parking spaces, a recreation building, a couple of swimming pools, significant site landscaping, and all of this is in a little over 12 acre site. Um, it was constructed in 1972 with changes approved by the City Council and Planning Commission in 1974 and 1989. So now to orient you a little bit with this slide, um, the first red circle here is the existing recreation building that we'll be talking a little bit about. Um, moving down the slide towards the south is the existing main entrance that you're probably familiar with. And there's a small exi existing leasing bu building that is located there. I'm sorry, a, a, a leasing office that's in a formal residential unit. Um, next, the next circle is the location of the proposed parking lot, which is kind of in a pie shape there. And then down at the bottom of the site is an existing surface parking lot where the new recreation and leasing building is proposed. So the project right now has three major components that I'd like to go over with you. The first is a new recreation and leasing building. It's proposed in the corner of the existing surface parking lot that we were just looking at down at the south end of the complex. The first floor is proposed to be a little over 3,000 square feet with the second floor at about 2,300 for a total of 5,470 square feet. They propose to locate all of their leasing functions and recreation functions in one combined building. And so that's a major element of the project. That's a good advantage to the property owners. So it would include a fitness area, game room, and resident lounge, along with the leasing function. The architectural style of the building is really inspired by buildings that we would often find in natural areas or in the mountains. And this really complements the location at the southern city limits which is really very park-like and, and a heavily tree in that area. So the, the, the style of the building really would update the um, image of the complex and would really set the standard for any future changes that they may make to the site over the years. During the review process, uh, the Architectural Review Committee had several comments which have been implemented into the style of the building. Um, notably, they've added additional architectural details on the ground floor. They've integrated the monument sign into the design of the building, and also we decided to paint the, this building to match the rest of the buildings that are in the complex, to tie it in and to have that unity be stronger. Um, that was a recommendation of the Architectural Review Committee. 
Near this new building, there would be new landscaping, um, which has been reviewed by staff and by the committee and well received, as well as a new trash enclosure, which would accommodate recycling and garbage in one structure, which would be designed to match the architecture of the building. Uh, the second major element of the project is the conversion of the existing recreation building into four new apartments. So the applicant would replace the exterior materials and paint it to match the um, rest of the buildings in the complex. And I did want to point out um, and discuss a little bit, since the applicant is proposing an increase in the density, it is appropriate to review in this case whether Ordinance 1284 applies to this project. So as the City Council is aware, Ordinance 1284 limits an increase in density in certain circumstances. So specifically, it states that density cannot be increased in residential districts. So as part of their submittal materials, the applicant has supplied a legal interpretation of Ordinance 1284, which is included as an attachment to your staff report. And that says that Crystal Springs is in a planned development district and not a residential district, and that those two things are distinct and therefore Ordinance 1284 does not apply. Staff has reviewed their interpretation and finds their interpretation to be reasonable really on two different levels. First, on a technical or, or kind of legal um, level, because a planned development district is different than an R1 or an R2 zoning district. It was at the time the 1284 was passed and it is today as well. So that's continued on. And then second, really in a practical sense, um, when Ordinance 1284 was passed, it was really in a reaction to sort of a, a fear that single-family neighborhoods would change and become higher density. It wasn't really in reaction to existing apartment complexes, which this one was, having a minor increase in density. So really from a practical point of view, staff does agree that 1284 doesn't really apply to this case, just on an everyday sort of logical, logical basis. The final determination, however, on this issue does rest with the City Council. And so as the ordinance and resolutions that are before you tonight were prepared, um, that increase in density is included. So your approval of the project tonight would indicate your concurrence with that interpretation that Ordinance 1284 does not apply to this project. So if I can move on to the third major element of the project, and that is a new parking lot that would serve the new residential units. It's proposed in an area of existing landscaping and would result in a small, approximately 1% uh, uh, reduction in landscaping on the site overall. It would uh, result in 12 net new parking spaces. And so it's 11 parking spaces for four new units. So it actually slightly um, exceeds today's standard for multifamily units. And so it would be a very slight improvement to parking in the site overall. They are proposing to construct the new parking lot of pervious paving. So this is a positive aspect of the project in terms of environmental or green building goals that we have. The small existing leasing office would be converted back into a residential unit for which it's al always been approved. But essentially the rest of the buildings on the site would, would remain unchanged. Um, the City Council may recall that the owners removed some trees along Crystal Springs um, that was with the Heritage Tree Permit. It was some time ago. So staff did just want to point out that the trees on the slope have been replanted, and there are a few that remain to be planted, but those are addressed in the conditions of approval here. They will not be double counted, and it will be fully planted, um, and those arrangements have been made. And so in regards to neighborhood outreach, um, staff notified neighbors prior to the Architectural Review Committee meeting Planning Commission public hearing, and the City Council public hearing. We did receive comments from one resident of London Court who expressed a concern about the parking, um, but upon additional discussion at the Planning Commission meeting and with staff, she did seem satisfied with the parking that would be provided for this project, and we have not heard any additional concerns from her since that time. When the Planning Commission reviewed the project in August, they passed two resolutions recommending that the City Council approve the project they did not have any additional changes or recommend any additional conditions of approval. So tonight there are two items for your consideration. The first is the ordinance, which would amend the development plan. And so in summary, that would increase the number of units by four, add a new recreation and leasing building, decrease the landscaping slightly, and increase the number of parking spaces. The second item is a resolution, which would approve the planned development permit and the architectural review permit. 
And so these are the, the kind of the implementing tools to implement the actual development plan. And this also includes the conditions of approval that would be placed on the project. So moving forward in terms of next steps, if the City Council um, approves this first reading, then the ordinance would return to City Council on November 9th, and then of course become effective 30 days later. In closing, staff would like to highlight the fact that we have worked very closely with this applicant over a fairly long, long stretch of time, and they really have um, worked with us well and made changes to the project to make those improvements, and as well as the recommendations made by the Architectural Review Committee. So staff recommends that the City Council introduce the ordinance and adopt the resolution tonight, and I would be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Any questions of staff? Through the chair, I just wanted to touch bases on uh, Ordinance 1284 to make sure that I have a clear understanding. So if it was in a residential zone district, which this is not, for example, an apartment building came down and they built it back up, but they increased the, uh, they increased the units, it would increase the density, which then would activate Ordinance 1284 and would not be allowed. No. Correct. I'm going to go with uh, if, the <laughs> non-lawyer. If, if, if it was in a residential district, for instance, on Mills or anywhere Mills, yes. in, the, in that exactly. area, if it was in a residential district, yes, it would activate 1284. Since this is not a residential district, it would not activate 1284. That's correct. That's the way planned development districts work. I've been dealing with them for over 30 years. They're a, an anomaly almost. It's, a, a, it's its own separate zoning district. You can put anything you want in a planned unit well, a planned development district, as long as it's consistent with the general plan. One of the interesting things about Ordinance 12, is 1284 is that it amended, the amendment and has the requirement for residential districts, but it never touches the general plan. It doesn't amend the general plan. If it did, then this would be, you, you'd probably be going to an election for this uh, change in density, but it doesn't. It doesn't amend it, and this planned development district, as amended, or as you would amend it, is consistent with the general plan. So I, uh, the opinion that the applicant's attorney gave, uh, in my interpretation, is a correct one. It also pointed out that the McDonough Holland uh, attorneys uh, from that firm uh, also uh, gave it a, they were apparently, uh, have been involved in this project before by the prior city attorney, and they had given a similar opinion themselves. And I agree with it. It's 1284. Uh, is uh, does not have to be amended for this um, for this project. Thank you. Good. Any other questions of staff? Through the chair, Mr. Ibera. Uh, I like the look of the new rec building and uh, a lot of glass and things, and I think it's in an appropriate place. I'm a little concerned about this conversion, though, and I'm gonna I'm gonna harp on the planning commission because they're always requesting all four elevations, and I'm having a hard time understanding what this building's really gonna look like. It's my understanding, and I have, and I apologize for not seeing it, it's my understanding that it is sort of set into the hill, or it's got some retaining walls around it? It is, yes. So if I'm looking at this lower floor, that's, a, that's two units at the lower floor, what are these windows looking at? Are they looking at retaining walls? I mean, or, or is it just one side that is I mean, I've got three elevations here, and one elevation is really a one-story. The, the, the west elevation is has, you know, is the upper <clears throat> floor only, and so the lower floor is is underground. So I'm assuming there are three sides of this building that are open. That, we believe that's true. Up. Why don't we ask the, if, if, if possible, why don't we ask the applicant when they're up here to better okay. explain all four elevations that they're proposing? Yeah, because I mean, the, the original building really doesn't have any openings on it, so now we're putting openings in it, and you need windows. So. Okay. Any other questions? And, 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 and if, I, if I could, just there's no other entrances that are being affected. It's all the same entrances, and the, and the parking lot is not off of Crystal Springs. It is, it, it is a private road access. The, what's today the main entrance 
would sort of be de-emphasized with the project. Okay. And so the location in front of the new recreation and leasing building would kind of become the new main entrance and the circulation would change a little bit there, but, but it, nothing that would have an impact on the city street. It, it's an existing entrance. The, the, it's an existing okay. entrance. And the park, the access to the parking lot is from within the property? Yes. Not off of Crystal Spring? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Michael? In, in that picture, in kind of following up on uh, Councilman Navarro's question, um, it kind of looks to me like the, the area that the pie-shaped area that you said would be the new parking lot isn't quite accessible. Uh, it's surrounded by buildings. It appears in that picture. How how would uh, cars have access to that area? There's an internal driveway, and so okay. the parking lot is designed to fit into that space. I see. Okay. With yeah, access so from the inside the of the complex. Right. Okay. Uh, my other question was regarding the um, the uh, picture that was on the on the front of the of the package. It shows um, the new building. Yeah, that, that one. Thank you. Uh, this new building is somewhat um, farther out uh, in uh, into well, closer to, to Crystal Springs than the older buildings, and it, I, I believe that sign that's there is also new. And I'm wondering how that affects visibility up and down. Crystal Springs as you pull out of that driveway? This issue has been reviewed very closely by engineering staff as well as planning staff. The way that the driveway is getting reconfigured, we actually find that it will be an improvement to site visibility. As you exit the complex now, you have to, you're coming out at an angle and look mm -hmm. far over your right shoulder if you're leaving. Um, now the driveway will be realigned so it won't be as far of an angle looking over your right shoulder. And actually, um, that's an important point in clarification. The color rendering that you have in front of you is more of an artist rendering. And the sign, as um, agreed upon by staff and by the applicant, would actually be pulled back, and so it wouldn't extend as far out towards the street. And so the other black and white materials that you have in your packet accurately show that, but unfortunately, the color rendering does not. And so it is something that we discussed and verified in the field, staff as well as the applicant, to, to locate the appropriate location for that sign. There's also going to be some tree removal to improve site visibility at that corner and replanting. Um, so all of the plants will be of a lower height and a driver will be able to see over them, which is not the case currently. So we believe that it will be an overall improvement to site visibility. Okay. And since you mentioned uh, tree removal, it also looks like the new uh, parking lot is going to go where there are some trees currently. And you mentioned uh, replacing trees that were removed previously. You just mentioned some more uh, tree removals and replacing them with shorter ones. Can you kind of uh, just educate me on what the, the city's policy is on when we replace trees? Uh, do they have to be of similar size, uh, type? Well, what is that policy? Yeah, there's two different situations here. The first is the trees that were removed with the heritage tree permit. And in general, that's a two for one replacement, but there's some specific technicalities that have to do with the size. Um, and that's implemented by the parks um, division staff. When there's a development project such as this, um, generally what we do in planning is to have a reasonable replacement that is either the same if it's not a heritage tree or um, using that double count if it is a heritage tree. So in this, in this case, um, no trees are gonna be double counted so to speak, so they have to fully plant to meet their heritage tree requirement, and then they're gonna be replacing trees that they're removing as part of the development proposal. So overall, there's gonna be an increase of trees on the site. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions from staff? I just have a quick question, thank you. First of all, I do appreciate the green aspects of the design. I, I think it's great <coughs> that we're incorporating those in our new developments. I was just having a concern, or is there a concern about pedestrian safety? There's I was looking at the color rendition and the girl is walking on the street there. Is there markings? Is there, is there any concerns about people walking in that area with the traffic going in and out now? Or going in and out differently? Or has that been looked at? Or should we look at it? I mean, is there like sidewalk markings or? There is a change in pavement. And I think that's another thing that we could ask the applicant um, to address as well. Um, but there's a change in pavement, and then there's curbs that separate um, the walkway from the parking spaces that are located there. Okay. And do we have any issues, or has it been reported of any issues of people leaving the Crystal Springs and going across to the park and having issues with 
traffic going up and down or nobody does that? I was just wondering. I haven't heard of that and it wasn't brought to my attention during the staff review process. Okay. Okay. Any, any other questions of staff? I'd like the applicant to come to the podium, please. We have some questions for you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and the City Council members. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, express our, um, our thanks to planning staff. As Laura had mentioned, this has been a probably a two and a half year process for us and we've, we've had a lot of communication with planning staff and particularly through Laura. So I did want to mention to the, um, to the council that I think that the planning staff did a great job in, in processing this project for us. And some of it was not easy, but we got through it and I think that we, we managed quite well and I appreciate Laura's efforts in, in helping us get to this point tonight. Um, I'd also like to introduce our um, team um, of people that are available for to answer questions. Uh, Mr. Tom Birch, who's counsel for uh, the owner, is available for questions with regards to his interpretation of uh, 1284. And then Ken Dressel and Jim Porter, who are representing the owner, Gerson Baker, tonight. And then um, Omar Hernandez from my office, from the architectural office, is here. Um, he developed the drawings for the project. My name is Andy Ramundo. I'm the, the architect for the project. Um, in response to some of the questions that, that just came up, and I, I'll address Mr. Um, Ibarra's questions first about the, uh, the window openings and the conversion of the uh, existing building. Um, it does sit on a slope. Um, currently, the side of the building that faces the drive aisle is sort of the single story element of the building and then the grade slopes off pretty steeply as you move along the sides. The way that the units are configured, um, the new units that are gonna be inside of this building are such that the private or bathroom windows are on the back side of the building facing the drive aisle. So we'll have the fewest amount of window openings on that wall, it, it'll face the drive area so that's an area where we don't want a lot of openings in the building. And then as you go to the downhill side of the building, this is where the uh, common space of the living room areas are for the units. And so those will have the largest windows, those will have views down the hill. And then <clears throat> the sides of the buildings also have windows into the bedrooms and they're more open on, on either side. So this, the restricted side is the uphill side that faces the drive aisle. And those are basically, that's a, essentially a plumbing wall with where the bathroom and, and plumbing stacks go. Um, with uh, regards to the question about pedestrian safety in front of the building, um, the, <clears throat> the rendering is maybe a little bit confusing. Um, I, do we have in that packet a, an image of the, the plan view, Laura? Is there anything in there? It, basically what we created in front of that building is a, is a pretty large concrete landing and a concrete pad area and a walkway that connects from the, from the building and the pedestrian entrance building, so where you sort of see the trellis area in front of the building, mm -hmm. is connected with a plaza area and then a walkway that goes back to the new parking. Okay. So, they, so they are connected and, um, and they're distinct and separate from the drive aisle area. Okay. Okay. Um, and then just a couple of general comments that I wanted to make. Um, I think for us, one of the nice green aspects of this project and when we were originally conceiving of it was the idea that when we realized that we couldn't convert the existing the existing rec building to house both the leasing function and the recreation facilities and it was decided to create an entirely new building on the site it gave us the opportunity to reuse the existing building um, we found that just in doing a quick study that we would have to do so much renovation on that building in order to house the sort of multiple functions that we wanted to put into it that we would essentially be obliterating the building. We'd be knocking it to the ground and rebuilding it. Um, the upper end of the site where you see this new building sitting is a very logical place to put the new function. It's um, adjacent to, a, to one of the two major driveway entrances. It's also up on a higher portion of the site, so we think that it has better visibility um, and sort of focal point identity. Um, one of the comments that was uh, made during our architectural review 
uh, was the style of the building and the fact that it is pretty distinctly different than the residential buildings. And one of the reasons that we departed from how the reg residential buildings are configured is, is sort of twofold. One is that the residential buildings are two-story, pretty plain, simple boxes with a, sing with a single ridge line. And when we imparted both the leasing function and the recreational functions into this building because its use is so intense, it's a much larger building. And so if we were to create two-story walls all the way around the building and do a single ridge line, the building would seem much more massive. And so this was sort of our effort, the final rendition of this, to downsize the verticality of the building, create some interesting architectural features. We are using a paint scheme and materials on this building that will tie to and be uh, consistent with the residential buildings, all the while the form is different. Um, but we feel that the form should be different. It's a different function, and it's a focal point on the property. So um, it was a very intentional um, sort of a departure. In terms of the, um, the monument sign, we did, as, as Laura mentioned, we did go through quite a bit of on-site sort of renovation of that sign and the length of that sign. I think that in this rendering that you see, the final resolution was that we cut the length of the sign back about five feet. And we did look at the view angles coming in and out of the driveway to make sure that we weren't obstructing views because this was sort of one of the things that was of primary importance when we were looking at it related to traffic. Um, there were some other issues about traffic flow coming in and out of the driveway. So we, we looked at this quite extensively as far as view in and out of this driveway. The other thing that I can tell you is that that driveway throat opening was much smaller previously. And now I think we're up around 35 feet of driveway width at the opening. So we, have, we think that we have very good visibility and certainly much better than what we had previously before we imparted the building onto this location. Um, so we just believe overall this is a very nice enhancement to the property. It'll, it'll keep it sort of uh, you know, consistent with other product that's in the marketplace. It has very nice amenities um, and it's gonna provide um, I think uh, a nice feature for the property and, and make the, give the longevity of the project, uh, you know, it'll, it'll just make it a, a project that'll last longer and be more consistent. And I'm here to answer any other questions that you have. Any other questions of the applicant? All right, seeing none, we'll open the public hearing at this time. Would any members of the public uh, like to address uh, the council regarding this item? Alan Lupke, Fleetwood Drive. I don't think that the first reading of any city ordinance should be waived, and I request that the proposed city ordinance be read. This reading will provide television viewers, particularly those who don't get to the library and don't get to City Hall, the chance for full access to the information. My name is Maxine Driscoll, and I live on Piedmont Avenue. I understand that when the Crystal Springs apartments were first built, the number of parking places was, was deemed adequate and met the code in effect at that time. Now, tonight I thought I heard you say that there were 67 parking places for 132 units. I hope I heard that incorrectly. Anyway, it's quite obvious that the current um, renters have more cars than uh, there are available parking places. The inadequacy of the par site parking is obvious by the number of cars parked on the street that goes over the freeway and into Crestmore Avenue. On most weekends and evenings, that street parking is at capacity. Since I recognize the same cars parked there night after night, um, the cars must belong to the renters and not to visitors to the apartments. Periodically, the city, worker, city workers post signs on the overpass stating no parking and a date. In fact, they did that a few days ago. They do this in order to clean the large amount of trash and debris 
left by the people who park there. They clean, and right now it's, it's fairly clean for that area, but then the trash begins to accumulate again. As I drive up Crystal Springs Road, I frequently notice the gardeners taking excellent care of the lands apartment landscaping. It's really nice. It's, it's a pleasant to drive by that complex. Then I see the messy trash on the overpass. It is sometimes really a disgusting sight. There is also the danger that this trash might blow over the railing and onto the freeway below, causing an accident. Perhaps the apartment management could do one of the following. One, ask their tenants not to use the street or the overpass as their personal trash cans. Or two, they might instruct their groundskeepers to remove the trash left by their tenants on this overpass. I'm bringing this to your attention because I think we all want a clean and safe uh, city and streets. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public would speak on this? Okay. Seeing none. Move to close public hearing. Second. Motion second to close the public hearing on the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, a couple of questions uh, to the city attorney. Give us the little parameters on first readings, reading them, not reading them. Yes, Mr. Mayor, the uh, government code again uh, allows city councils to waive the reading word by word of an entire ordinance. This is quite common. Virtually every city in California does it. Uh, the um, uh, probably the most direct answer. Uh, it, it, it's done every time by virtually every city. Uh, I have, in all my experience, have never seen a city council read through an entire ordinance. Uh, that ordinance is, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's in the agenda packet. If someone wanted to read the entire thing, uh, probably the reason uh, the law allows the waiving uh, of the reading of the ordinance uh, is that, you know, it, it's followed a public hearing, it's followed a staff report, and the reading of the ordinance would probably be redundant. Uh, it's available online as well. All right, thank you. Um, to community thank development you. regarding parking, can you address that? There was a little question on what was heard and what. So right now there are 628 parking spaces on site and the current parking ratio is 1.45 parking spaces per unit. Um, when it was originally approved, there was a difference between the number of parking spaces per bedrooms and things like that, a little bit different than what our code allows today. So um, under the proposed conditions, there would be 437 units, 639 parking spaces for a parking ratio of 1.46 parking spaces. So that's a slight increase, very slight increase from pre-project conditions. Okay. Did the issue of uh, the overpass and cleaning and parking on the overpass ever come up in planning? Or we discussion? have seen people parking on the overpass, and there were residents that told us that that was the case. We did not receive any concerns um, prior to this in regards to trash on the overpass. Okay. Do you know of any, uh, any issues uh, maybe Public Works can answer this uh, with, with street cleaning. Do we have any issues up there that are extraordinary? Honorable Mayor, Council Members, good, e good evening. Uh, this uh, new section of uh, uh, the special attention was added to our program uh, I think uh, two years ago, based on your direction, uh, wasn't a special uh, uh, program developed or uh, Public Works did not uh, uh, clean this section uh, of uh, the overpass uh, before. Uh, right now, I didn't, how was told by one of the residents that uh, uh, just was cleaned by Public Services uh, a few days ago. Yes, I heard comment that uh, whenever they are going back is uh, very messy, uh, but uh, 
wasn't brought to my attention that uh, this would create any special uh, concern. All right, thank you. City Manager. I, I was just going to add that um, that uh, additional special attention with the periodic special cleaning where cars are not allowed to park for a period of time in order that the street sweeper and the public works crews can get in um, was necessitated by uh, some amount of concern that has occurred over a number of years. Um, this procedure is similar to what we do down uh, along Shelter Creek Lane and has been a very effective means of maintaining at least a reasonable uh, level of um, uh, attention to those areas, um, but uh, I think the director uh, articulated exactly what we do and what we've observed up there. Okay, and maybe just uh, as an aside, the uh, the management could uh, kind of get the word out to encourage people to take care of their their trash, their coffee cups, and things. We'd really appreciate that. It would help us out. There's a Irene. Thank you. Do, does anyone know where the nearest trash can? closest to you is from there? Is there any way that you could put a trash can close by that people would be encouraged to throw their trash in there instead of on the street? Yes, no, maybe. It's too far. Yeah, it's too far. Okay. Okay, well, thank let's, you. Let's see how that goes going forward. Uh, if not, we'll get you back and have a little talk. <laughs> Uh, Michael? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, a couple of, uh, couple of things. Uh, Mr. Lubke, re regarding uh, your, your uh, question about the, the reading of the ordinance, I know when, uh, when I was sitting down there, I was also um, wondering why we never got to hear the ordinances read. And uh, af actually, after reading a few of them, I, uh, <laughs> I don't regret not having that happen. Um, I, I would ask uh, the city manager uh, uh, or, or, uh, or the city clerk, uh, if somebody is interested in reading an ordinance prior to one of our meetings, is that made available to the public? Uh, it, absolutely. The uh, packet is uh, posted online. Uh, Mr. Lubke has correctly identified that not everybody has access to computerized information, however. Um, in addition to uh, making it available in that manner, the packet is available at the San Bruno Public Library. It is available through the city clerk's office at City Hall. And uh, we make available any agenda items in written form to individuals who request that information. I believe the clerk is well prepared to provide that uh, by mail or uh, in the manner that the, the resident or in interested party wishes to receive it. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, that's correct. The, a summary, uh, the law requires that we provide a summary, at least, of the ordinance uh, to be published in the newspaper at least 10 days prior to any public hearing, so we do that as well. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Lovey, hopefully that gives you some options. Well, yes, uh, <clears throat> my, uh, my request was based upon principle, and the principle... <clears throat> stems from historic goings on at, the, at these meetings, particularly with regard to several years ago, the proposal of an increase in sales tax. And that particular ordinance, proposed ordinance, was first reading was waived, second re reading was waived, and uh, you know, there's no excuse for that because we have people who, who, who rely solely on their knowledge of what's going on here at the city council meeting with what is seen here on television. So I just uh, ask that we have uh, more open visibility and we not try to hide anything. I felt that at the time of that sales tax was proposed that, that Mr. Uh, Mr. Lubke, let's don't get off the track here, all right? It's been made very clear that this ordinance is readily available for anyone who wants to read it. Um, any action by the City Council? We need two actions here. Through the Chair, before we do that, 
I, I would like to encourage uh, the management also to uh, a little outreach to the residents, and I, I'm, I and I'm probably going to go out. And I'm going to assume that a majority of those that park on the overpass are residents of uh, Crystal Springs Terrace apartments. There may be some that uh, park that live up the hill in other, in other but. Uh, if that's the case that a majority of them do park there, I would hope that they can uh, uh, take some care, just like the resident says, in uh, uh, helping maintain, you know, the the beauty the beauty of that of that area. And if they don't, I'm sure this resident or other residents may come to us, and we may not be as accommodating because we can we can put restrictions on that parking. Um, so with that. Unless there's no other comments, I'd like to make a motion to waive the first reading. And based on the motion's comments, I will also concur with everything you just said and second that. Motion to motion to second to waive the first reading. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Your chair, I'd like to introduce the uh, ordinance or adopt the resolution. Oh, ordinance first. Or, or introduce the ordinance for uh, adoption. The ordinance. Councilmember Ibera. Aye. Councilmember Salazar. Aye. Councilmember O'Connell. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Mayor Ruain. Aye. And now I'd like to uh, adopt the resolution approving the plan development permit and architectural review permit. Councilmember Ibera. Aye. Councilmember Salazar. Aye. Councilmember O'Connell. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Mayor Ruain. Aye. Item number nine, public comment on items not on the agenda. It is the council's policy to refer matters raised in this form to staff for investigation and interaction where appropriate. The Brown Act prohibits the council from discussing or acting upon any matter not agendized pursuant to state law. Uh, any member like to speak under public comment? My name is uh, Alan Lubke, live on Fleetwood Drive. At, uh, Mr. Mayor, at the closed session of the October 12th meeting, you said that donations being received by the city should be posted so that people can see the amounts and where they have come from. Have these been posted and where can we see, see them? I don't believe we have that yet, but that's being worked on. City Manager? Um, it, we can certainly provide a list. We can post that at City Hall. I'm assuming we're talking about the donations for the Glenview fire victims. Is that, is that the topic? We're talking about the fire, Glenview fire, pop, the pipeline explosion. Yeah. Yes, we will I'm post just, that. I was just reinforcing your... Uh, yes, we will post that at City Hall. As you know from tonight, we're still getting donations right. in on a daily basis. So. I, uh, I would like to see an agenda item on the next City Council meeting with a report on the execution of the recommendations from the Traffic and Safety Committee and approved by the City Council to implement the solutions to traffic calming resulting from the extensive study of traffic conditions on Fleetwood Drive by a private group under contract with the city. Thank you. Any other members of the public on public comment? All right, we'll move right to item number 10. On conduct of business, item 10A is receive oral report and review status of local emergency related to the Glenview fire area and adopt a resolution continuing the declaration of local emergency. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. At the special meeting uh, that was held last Tuesday evening, uh, the City Council authorized uh, me to execute a contract uh, with a qualified a construction contractor to provide certain uh, slope stability improvements at the at the mouth of the canyon uh, just adjacent to the Glenview explosion and uh, fire location uh, that is a particularly sensitive and important issue at the current time because the, with the uh, completion of the demolition and debris remo removal process over the past approximate 10 days. The canyon is now um, bare of its previous vegetation and, uh, and in particular trees that were uh, seriously burned and uh, damaged, destroyed in the fire. Um, the work to 
complete the immediate tasks of uh, providing erosion control at the face of the canyon and to provide a um, to provide um, uh, treatment in the bottom of the canyon for erosion control purposes is approximately at this point approximately one third complete work is continuing and staff advises me that we are on track to complete that initial phase of the work uh, within the necessary time frame to deal with the continuing and coming uh, more severe winter storms. Additional phases of this work, as we discussed with the council at the meeting last week, will consist of improvements, uh, rebuilding of retaining walls in two locations where fire damage uh, seriously compromised the integrity of the walls and their ability to perform their required functions as retaining structures in the sensitive areas of the canyon adjacent to private properties. Uh, that work has not yet begun, but is in the, uh, in the planning phases, uh, coordination with the contractor, and mobilizing and uh, uh, making the necessary arrangements with the adjacent private property owners. Um, with that said, the need to continue the existence of the emergency conditions continues. And at this point, I anticipate continuation of the local emergency declaration uh, at least through the beginning of the rainy season and at the minimum, the completion of this necessary work in the canyon. We are continuing to evaluate the need for the uh, continuation of the local emergency and will certainly advise the City Council at the earliest possible time uh, when we're able to determine that uh, those provisions are no longer necessary. Okay. Any questions of the city manager regarding Mr. Michael? Uh, was there any noticeable change to the, to the area after the rain that we got this last weekend? Uh, are we seeing any sort of impact uh, from the limited amount of rain we've gotten so far? Um, I, I would like to ask the director respond. Uh, what I can tell you is that staff has been carefully monitoring the area along with our construction contractor uh, because obviously we're, wa we're also watching the rain predictions very carefully and mobilizing as needed to stay on top of what's going on out there. A little closer, Clara. Thank you. Sorry, you better start again. <laughs> you heard me or I have to repeat. Wow. Yeah, you, you should repeat it for the, for the listening audience. Based on the work, uh, preparatory work done for the slope of uh, the canyon uh, before the rain came, uh, was no damage to the slope of uh, the canyon at all. Okay, thank you. And can you, while you're down here, can you comment on the overall safety of the area? Um, just uh, is, it, uh, is it is it still considered a hazardous area within the area of its quadrants did not fence up if you are referring to the canyon itself uh, it's I actually the entire area um, including the streets certainly uh, from a uh, public health and safety point of view uh, the public uh, uh, health emergency was lifted uh, by uh, the county uh, weeks ago. That means uh, is uh, does not uh, present any uh, health risk at this time to the residents of the area. Uh, certain portion of the sidewalk and the street uh, are damaged behind repair, but those sections uh, are close to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, entirely uh, is only just anybody can access that uh, protected area only just based on special permit like uh, doing any kind of work in the area 
or uh, the residents already moved back uh, to uh, that uh, uh, closed area uh, before uh, uh, any any additional uh, changes in the overall uh, uh, restriction of the area will be lifted, then further restriction and protection of uh, those uh, damaged area will be implemented. Uh, how I said, uh, certain portion of the sidewalk and uh, street are unsafe, uh, and those will be uh, closed before uh, any general uh, access will be allowed in that area. Thank you. Okay. Any questions on this item? If there's none, I'll go ahead and um, introduce a resolution continuing the declaration of local emergency. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Council Member Ibera. Aye. Council Member Salazar. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. Mayor Ruane. Aye. Item B adopt a resolution amending the masterpiece schedule rental rate for senior center assembly room allowing use of the kitchen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. While approving the master fee schedule as part of the 2010-2011 budget process, the City Council asked staff to work with both the Senior Advisory Board and the Parks and Recreation Commission to develop a process that would allow renters of this room um, here in the Senior Center use of some of the equipment in the kitchen. Staff met with both bodies, um, worked through the interests of both that are listed in your packet, and develop the following recommendation that renters of the facility would be allowed to use the kitchen's steam table oven and stove they would pay for one additional building attendant there would not be an additional cost to use the room um, but they would pay for the additional building attendant and that building attendant is the person who would directly operate the equipment they would be trained on how to use the equipment and therefore it would it would um, make sure that the equipment was available for use um, for the lunch programs the following days. The renters will be barred from use of the facility from future rentals if they abuse the facility in any way um, and if they go outside of the boundaries. The specific action tonight um, that is being presented to you would amend the master fee schedule to indicate that renters using the kitchen must pay for one additional facility attendant um, for the use of the kitchen. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have, and there are members of the Senior Advisory Board here in our audience. Question for you, Randy. <laughs> it says here that the attendant will oversee users by operating the kitchen equipment. So if I come in and I want to rent the facility and I have, uh, you know, 500 frozen pies, is that, is that, uh, is he going to cook it for me or is she going to cook it for me? Well, they'll make sure that they, they turn on the stove and the oven properly, and if there's any issues with it, you would see the facility attendant. But in terms of stirring the spaghetti and putting the items in and out, the recipes are all on the renter still. So this would be someone that would be trained to oversee the use of the, uh, use of the items, right? And to make sure that they turn it on properly, that they adjust temperatures as necessary, that things are turned off properly, that the care is taken care, uh, that the care is provided to the equipment. Um, the Senior Advisory Board's largest concern is that they cook several hundred meals on a daily basis and that the equipment needs to be in shape for those meals. Okay, and I see you have a new lockable refrigerator in, in this request also. One of the items that people talked about both on the Parks and Rec Commission and from the City Council is um, additional space for refrigerated or freezer items. The space that's currently available for such uses in the kitchen um, is full with all of the items for the lunch program. We would be purchasing out of the funds of the senior division a new refrigerator freezer to be pushed to be placed in the closet behind me and the facility attendant would make that um, refrigerator freezer available to the renters as necessary. Questions? To the chair. So uh, on a Saturday night, we have a big fundraiser here, and they typically come in, they rent the facility four hours minimum, and some go as much as six, seven hours. So these, the extra attendant that would be overseeing the kitchen, uh, how would that be figured into the cost? Is that the entire time of the rental, or is that for just the amount of time <coughs> that it, there's cooking? 
It would be the entire time of the rental. Um, the original facility attendant would actually be here a little bit before the group arrives and after they leave to handle the setup and the cleanup. The facility attendant who is here because of the kitchen would be here just the time that the party is scheduled. And that is at the $15 an hour rate that is listed in the master fee schedule. So, okay. So for a six hour party, they would be here for the six hours. The groups, most of the time the groups going to continue to use it. They're not going to just do the cooking and leave and come back. They're still going to do cleanup and those things. And that facility tenant will be there the whole time that the kitchen is, is occupied for the rental. So it would be the same as what you pay the, the, the attendant outside for the amount of hours? The hourly rate is the same. It would actually probably be, about, typically would be about an hour less, possibly two hours less. Um, if you have that four hour rental, you are usually paying the first facility attendant to be here before your party starts. They need to set up the tables and the chairs and those things. Um, and then they are here after you have left the facility on your four hour party. They need to clean up and put away tables and chairs and some of those functions. So that you usually paying the first facility attendant for maybe an hour longer than the party goes. Four hour rental, you're probably paying the facility attendant for five hours. They're here to open and close in addition to being here during your event. Okay, and I noticed on the fee schedule that that's not included in the in the master fee. So we add that on to the actual rental of facility. And in this case, and then, and then with the extra, uh, the, the kitchen, uh, what are we calling the kitchen, uh, kitchen monitor, what are, that would add also. So we're talking probably a couple hundred dollars on top of the actual rental of facility. I would guess 60 to 100 and 110 dollars depending two, on how long. For two attendants. If they're in here. We are not recommending any additional charge for the facility um, with the concept being that more rentals um, would still generate more revenues from the city. When our intern um, a couple of months ago did a study of all of the, a survey of all of the similar facilities throughout the county. Um, the fees of this were a little bit higher. The idea was to include that and not to raise the fees for the facility as well. But we are raising the fees because now we're paying for someone else to. So, okay. Questions? Through Vice the Mayor. chair. Um, I probably am unique in the sense that one, this building uh, opened up in 1987. Uh, we had the first uh, wedding reception, which was the O'Brien wedding. I remember renting that with Wendy Mines. So I had the privilege of renting out um, the facility here. And back then, we did allow this usage of these items. Uh, back then, though, we didn't have the daily meal preparation that was done. The county brought it in. So I know there's a concern of balancing. I'm hoping that the refrigeration unit will help that, because obviously it's full where before we are able to accommodate a renter. I know it's not specified here, but and it's not included to be able to use it, but I do not believe the dishwasher should be able to be utilized by the group. I think that's, and I know it doesn't say, but I just want us on the same page. My recommendation would be not. Uh, I've seen too many times when we rented it out back then, don't know how it is today, that um, it's just not used properly. Uh, they try to think you can put all kinds of stuff through it, which is, it, it just doesn't function and it, it usually breaks it down. So that would be a recommendation of mine. Also, if we find that there's uh, problems, uh, if this is adopted and going forward, uh, I would hope that um, staff or the commissioner board would come back, say the board, because they're the ones who have the day-to-day -day operations in here and will know, obviously, way before we will, if there's a concern or problem. Um, I think it was of a benefit back then uh, for, for users to have some of those um, items available to them. There was not an attendant back then. I think that's something that I think the school district uses that I think has been of a benefit to them in order to continue their lunch program because ours is crucial to the needs of the seniors of this community and the surrounding communities. So though I am in favor of us moving forward with an attendance, so I think anyone that we get from here that's going to watch that will have the same love and care as if it were their own kitchen. And so I think that will be an intricate part to ensure uh, a good event and that the kitchen is ready to go for the seniors on Monday morning. Sir Randy, the dishwasher is not mentioned. 
Uh, was it ever talked about? It was talked about extensively, and staff and the board and the commission all agree um, with the vice mayor's opinion. It's an item, it's difficult to use. It does break down quite often. It takes a lot of time to use if, if you're talking about large parties. Um, most people are using caterers anyway. They can just load things up and they can take them back to their place and do the cleaning back there. There's been very few requests for it. It's more of requests for to bring in um, lasagnas or things like that to heat them up in the stove, to use the steam tables. Washing dishes is not something that we get much of anyway, and so it's not part of the recommendation. Okay, so that's not included. It's not included. Right. Any other questions or action? One, one last question, yes. if I could. Now, were any of the <coughs> irregular, regular groups that use the, the, the facility, were they contacted and asked if they, you know, if this was a, a better thing for them to, to be able to use the kitchen uh, at an added cost? They were not specifically asked um, about that for this recommendation. Um, the staff and the board both felt that the, that the items here are the items that they have requested to use in the past. So it met their interest, but no, you are correct. We did not um, specifically go out and, and ask them their opinion. Of it. In, in the previous request, was it said that we'd pay for it if we, if we were able to use it? Any, any comments like that that you uh, recall? That I cannot answer. I don't know. Okay. Through the chair, Larry. just to be clear, if you do not want to use those items, you do not have to pay for attendant. Mm -hmm. So when you rent, you, so when people come up and they say, I want to rent this place and I want to do this and I want to do that, it, I'm assuming you're going to make it very clear to them that this is, you know, to do the kitchen, this is this and this, you know, A, B, and C, and these are all the things that you need to do. Well, there is one facility attendant with any of the rentals that here. There's always right. somebody on right. duty. This would be for an additional person just for the kitchen. Yeah, if I you did not want to use the kitchen, then the f facility attendant who is here would just make sure that you do not have access to the <coughs> kitchen. You do not get to use the equipment at all. Right. I, I'm just saying when people ask to rent this place that those choices are clear to them. Oh. Okay. We, we will do that. Yes. I apologize, uh, Mr. Mayor, one follow-up. Mm -hmm. Let me just give a, an example. If we have a elementary school here that's having a, a dinner and they're utilizing the kitchen only to use as a serving area for refreshments and maybe they use the steam table to have ice and the refreshments in there as they hand them out, that would then, would that constitute an additional attendant or would it not? It would not. It would be the same as it's been, been handled at this point. It would just be the use of the equipment if they're turning on the ovens, if they're turning on the steam tables, if they're turning on the stove. Those types of things would necessitate the, the additional building attendant. Thank you. Okay. Any action? Let's do it. I'd like to <laughs> adopt the resolution. Council Member Ibera. Aye. Council Aye. Member Salazar. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Mayor Ruane. Aye. Item C. Adopt a resolution approving new red curb on the north side of Sylvan Avenue west of Maryland Place, on the east side of Mastic Avenue north and south of Maryland Place, and the north side of Commodore Drive east and west of the parking lot entrance to Peninsula Place condominiums located at 1126 Cherry Avenue. Let, let me do let me do one more thing. I'm just gonna back up my prerogative if it's all right with you. <laughs> You're the mayor. Do you want to say something regarding the last item at the podium, please? My name is Gloria Dieter. I'm the nutrition site manager. I cook over anywhere from 460 meals to 600 meals a week here on the site. And as a devil's advocate, so we do open up our kitchen and our facility and some of our equipment and something does go wrong, who's to say that I come in on Monday morning and I don't have my equipment and the facility running up to its functionality? You know, who's to say that I have to use the stove, the oven, 
steam table, which is not steam table has not been a problem, but we have a you know very sensitive you know equipment, and I'm coming in here to provide a service to my community, and if my equipment is not up to a, its proper working order, what do I do? Okay. What's the answer to that? Randy, could you address us at the podium with that so we're not moving too many people around? Um, I, I would guess that there's plenty of deposit in place, number one, if there is, in fact, a, a, somebody breaks something. But number two, I would guess that the new attendant that would be in charge that is trained to operate this stuff is going to make sure that it's operating before and after that rental party leaves. That is correct. There's both the deposit and the facility attendant would immediately know before the event left um, if things were in proper working order. If they were not, um, we would be contacting facilities division <coughs> who would be working on the issues immediately. But the reason to have the facility attendant is to make sure that everything here is in proper working order, that they are the ones that are touching the knobs, buttons, etc., cetera, um, and not the renters. Um, that was also one of the conditions from the Senior Advisory Board. That's why they asked that if people do abuse this, if they can be barred from future uses. Mm -hmm. That would be very difficult to do for private parties. would be more something that would be going on for organizations. Uh, through the Chair, and I appreciate the question because I'll be the first to say getting called out at 1 a.m. in the morning to mop floors, Ray Gomes taught me how to mop a floor correctly because he was in the military, is that is there some provision that all of a sudden the attendant's taking stock and inventory notices that at midnight uh, going into Sunday that obviously there's a concern? Whom would they contact on that Sunday to try to make any type of necessary arrangements so that Monday it is functioning and operational for the needs of the seniors? They would contact either the um, supervisor of the facilities division, Renee Walsh. They can contact um, the, the head of the um, senior division, or they can contact me, and we will be working with them depending on what the issues are. If it's mopping floors, I can help you, but in that category, I'm probably not. If it's but mopping floors and those things, there is a custodial company that's also coming in. Um, on weekdays, we do have 23 hours a day there is a custodian um, on duty somewhere within the city. That is not true for weekends. Um, but, the, but the supervisor of the facilities division um, is available, um, or we do have lead persons. Um, so all the facility tenants would have a, a list of phone numbers to contact. So we'll have a contingency plan in place in, just in case the, the un, unforeseen may happen. That is correct. Thank you. All right, thank you. And you heard the vice mayor is available for mopping. <laughs> mopping only. I haven't forgotten how to do that here. It's been a while. I don't know how to do it. Now we will go to item 10C. Good evening again. Um, the draft resolution before you tonight is to install red curves at five different locations. The first light is for Maryland Place. Staff received a letter from a local resident indicating that parked vehicles on Sylvan Avenue obstruct entry to the one-way Maryland place and that there is a limited clear sight distance at the exit to Mastic Avenue. Staff conducted a study and presented the result to the TSBC. Staff validated the turning movement concern and identified there is a sight distance deficiency. Staff is forwarding TSBC's recommendation for Council's consideration to install 10 feet of red curb on Sylvan Avenue west of the entrance to Maryland Place to improve vehicle turning movement, especially for emergency vehicles. Second is to install 10 feet and 40 feet of red curb along Mastic Avenue north and south of Maryland Place to improve the sight distance for motorists exiting Maryland Place. This recommendation will not resolve loss of, <coughs> excuse me, loss of standard street parking on Sylvan Avenue. However, there will be three lots on Mastic Avenue. The second slide is um, the location for Commodore Drive. Staff received a letter from the manager of Peninsula Place condominiums requesting options to improve visibility when exiting the parking lot on Commodore Drive. 
STAT conducted a study and presented the result to the TSBC. STAT identified there is a limited site distance at this location and is forwarding their recommendation for your consideration. The recommendation is to install 40 feet and 10 feet of a curb on Commodore Drive east and west of the parking lot entrance to improve site distance for motorists exiting the parking lot. This recommendation will result in total of three standard parking spaces. That concludes the presentation. Any questions? Any questions? Michael? Uh, going back to the, uh, to the first location, uh, I, I drove down uh, Maryland Place, and it's a very narrow street, and there's not a lot of parking, although there are some driveways in there. But I noticed that on Mastic, half of the street is all red. The very top end near Angus is, I believe, two-hour parking. And uh, the parking lots that, are, that service the businesses have five-hour limits. And there's a number of driveways along the rest of Mastic which leave very few parking spots. So I'm wondering um, if, if we lose a couple more parking spots there, I think it's going to have a pretty significant impact. It, it seems like there's already nowhere to park. Um, the city, the city operated parking lot is, um, I believe, it, the time limited restriction ends at 6 o'clock. So there is options for the re local residents to park in the city operated parking lot. Um, you, we could, you have the option to modify this resolution and to, li to shorten the record distance. Okay, well, okay. And um, the, the recommendation uh, based on the visibility there, did that have something to do with the uh, amount of traffic or the speed of the traffic on, on Mastic? because it, it doesn't seem that limited, and it seems like it's not, uh, at least not a major thoroughfare. Um, traffic, traffic speed and volume-wise, um, I believe it one way? it's normal. It's not high volume, and it's not high speed. But with cars parked, especially as you exit Maryland onto Mastic, for the left, your left, as the driver looking at that, that side, it's a little bit difficult when cars are all parked. And then um, 40 feet down, there is a driveway. And if the, the residents park their larger vehicle on the driveway, not into their garage, it just it makes that side distance even more limited. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Through, through the chair. 40 feet seems like a long this is like a long distance. Now, you just mentioned that 40 feet goes to the, the uh, to the next driveway. Is, is that just a random number, or is I mean, or is the uh, the preferred preferred site distance is, is always 40? Because I I noticed on the other on the other proposal, it's also 40 feet, 10 and 40. So I'm just saying, is is, um, is there is there a is there ability without losing that uh, the sense of safety is her ability to be less than 40 or is or we use the um, the standard traffic uniform court code and basically we based on this traffic speed we use the table to as a reference to calculate how much of the site distance a motorist would need exiting certain intersection or in this case the narrow driveway you might so if there's like I said we could sh we, there's an option that we can shorten it and if there is a persistent problem we can come back and um, increase the record length <laughs> I, through the chair I, I'm with Ken I think 40 feet is awful long. So how long is a standard parking space? 20, 20 feet. 20 feet. Yeah. So if we just made that particular one 20, um, if, you, if you make it 10, you're still losing two parking spaces. So you need to, if you left it 20, you'd leave one parking space. Is that how it works? 
um, for the, math six, then will be because the total so we're calculating <laughs> um, the available length. So from the entrance, for example, the one that is for 10 feet, mm -hmm. um, we, lo we lost one there because, for example, if the, this, the clear distance over there without restriction is 50 feet right now, that gives us two standard parking spaces, even okay. though there's leftover. But if we take away one, we, that can still give you two. But then in the 40 feet example, whether you take 10 or 20, you lose one for sure. Yes. Okay, so if we, if we, would you be comfortable with 20? I mean, that <laughs> just seems 40 is a long, four, I mean, 40 is, isn't it, this is about 40, right? This, the, this, this distance. Yeah. Is it this yeah, more? This whole building is 40 feet wide. Yeah, so I, I suggest we do 20 and 10. And if, as you say, it comes and it's still a difficulty and still cause problems, then you can come back. But my suggestion is 20 and 10. Because if I could ask, because currently with no restrictions, people are parking right up to the corner. Yes. Okay. Right. So at least we'll get <clears throat> 10 and 20 feet of relief, which should help and should improve the visibility. By a lot. So do you want to, is that one resolution? Uh, yeah, I believe it's good, one resolution. City oh, it's attorney. all one? Oh, okay. You can do it with one resolution. You have a problem with 40 on the Commodore? Yeah, do you want it on the yeah. other one? Yeah. 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 Yes, one resolution. Okay. Eh, I lost it. Oh, no, I can't find it. Same thing with no, no. 10 and 40. <laughs> I don't have my. Di have my yeah. The one on, so the one on Commodore. Oh, say, so is this a separate resolution? It looks here that it's this one and the one on Commodore are a combined resolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm suggesting 20 and 10 on this one. And on the Commodore, tell me again why it's 40 on the Commodore. I mean, why 40 and not 20? Um, Basically the same thing. It's Basically we, the same we, thing. We're using the same table as a reference, and it, it gives us the distance as a guideline. OK. Is there anything now at all? There is none right now on Commodore Drive. OK. So both yeah. sides are not restricted. OK. And, and I understand as you're coming out left why you'd want more line of sight. But again, 40 feet seems like an awful lot. So again, I suggest 10 and 20. <laughs> so unless there's other comments, I'll introduce this resolution with 10 and 20 on both pieces. And if there's um, complaints always, that come up always, after that, more red. to bring it back to us. We always had red. Is that clear to staff? Yes. Okay. Right. So I'll introduce the resolution with those clarifications or changes. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. Councilmember Ibera. Aye. Councilmember Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Medina. Aye. Mayor Ruane. Aye. Item 10D, adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a contract with ERS Industrial Services, Inc. in the amount of $32,970 for the well number 16 filter project. Good evening, your honorable mayor and council members. Thank you for your time. I'm here on behalf of public services. And uh, tonight we're gonna be recommending awarding the filter media replacement bid for well 16 to ERS industrial in the amount of $32,970. The median is used to remove iron and manganese from the groundwater. This is a routine filter maintenance, which takes place roughly every 10 years as the filter media loses its effectiveness. On August 30th of 2010, an RFP was issued and on September 14th of 2010, the city received four competitive bids with ERS Industrial as a low bidder. Uh, public Service recommends awarding the bid to ERS Industrial. Okay. This is just standard maintenance. Exactly. Okay. Questions or actions? 
I think you didn't introduce yourself. Uh, Marty Cardone, water services manager. And since you stayed, I thought you'd at least get an acknowledgement. Through the resolution. Thanks. <laughs> Through the chair? Yes. I have a question. Is there differences in the filters themselves? I mean, are we buying the best quality filter that we can? Um, it's the media. It it's what's inside, of, it's what's inside the filter. It's the, the vessels stay the same. It's just that inside is, is losing its effectiveness. So there's, there's four elements. There's gravel, um, there's cement, gravel, sand, and anthracite coal. And over time, they just wear out. Okay, so there's there's nothing. I mean, if we spend a little more money, we're not going to get a better product. It's just no, what it is. No, okay. No, it's it's the best available. Okay, thank you. Option. Oh yes, <laughs> I'll introduce the resolution. Councilmember O'Connell, aye. Councilmember Ibera, aye. Councilmember Salazar, aye. Vice Mayor Medina, aye. Mayor Ruane, aye. Item 10E, receive a quarterly financial report as of September 2010 for the 2010-2011 General Fund, Special Revenue Funds, Enterprise Funds budget. Money? You got money? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, this item is to review the first quarter results for the general funds, special revenue funds, uh, internal service funds, and the enterprise funds uh, of the city. We begin with the uh, general fund. Uh, for the first, for the first quarter, revenues are at 16% of budget, uh, or $4.9 million. This is comparable to the same level that we had in the prior year. Um, one of the primary reasons that uh, revenues are not exactly 25% is that there's seasonalities in revenues. Uh, for instance, property tax is one of the major revenues in which we don't receive the revenues until the latter part of the calendar year. The first installment is not due from the county, for instance, until December, and the second installment until April, May. So I'll go over some of the key revenues, the larger revenues for the general fund. I'll start with property taxes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these are uh, received during the latter part of the fiscal year and uh, currently through the first quarter we're only at 1%, but that's really comparable to what we expect uh, on, a, on, a, on a fiscal year basis. We did get uh, information from the county in terms of revenue estimates uh, for the city of San Bruno and our budgets are very comparable to that level, so I do expect that uh, at the end of the fiscal year we'll be very close in meeting the budgeted targets for property taxes. Next, we'll go to sales tax. Sales tax is the second largest general fund uh, revenue category. And through the first three months, we're at 9% uh, of the budget. Uh, now, this in only includes uh, the first month of revenues. Uh, sales taxes are traditionally received uh, in the rears. Uh, with estimates based on prior year's levels and adjustments based on state's uh, estimates of growth or negative growth, for that matter. Uh, we did receive some positive news from our sales tax consultants in the last quarter. Uh, sales tax revenues were up uh, around 4.7% compared to the same period of the prior year. So while one quarter does not really make the, the, the trends, certainly it's a positive sign for, for the city. And since I'm talking about positive signs, another element or another category of revenues that's showing some positive growth is in the area of TOT tax. Uh, the, the, one of the better measurements in terms of uh, the health, in terms of revenue health for the city is TOT because we get those revenues on a monthly basis as the hotel properties, motel properties, receive the, the TOT taxes that they collect, we receive, the city uh, is remitted those amounts one month in the rear. So it's a good barometer in terms of how things are going. And in terms of, in terms of TOT revenues, even though it's not in the top five category, we're seeing uh, in excess of 30% growth. 
Now, some of that growth is contributed by the fact that we increased TOT rate from 10% to 12% back in November of 2009. However, even if I shave that off, we still do see positive growth in that area. So again, some positive signs. But I, 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 I want to reemphasize a little bit of a caveat. You know, uh, two months of TLT revenues doesn't really tell us we're not we're going to be able to hit revenue, tar revenue targets for the entire general fund uh, at the conclusion of, of the 12 month period. I move on to the next largest category, which is um, actually I'm not moving along in here. Uh, next next largest category is uh, vehicle license fee. Uh, most of the vehicle license fee is actually an in lieu payment. Uh, paid with property tax and therefore we're seeing a very small amount through the first three months and again we'll see that money when we get the property tax revenues come December. Uh, majority of that 3.3 million dollars is in, in lieu money there. Uh, next category is charges for services. What those are are primarily uh, cost allocations uh, to the various departments and the various funds and then a, a smaller portion of that is really the uh, billing services that we provide for uh, the garbage services there. So we're right at the 25% level uh, for the, for the three-month period. And the last of the uh, larger categories in terms of general funds is use of money and property. That includes uh, investment earnings from our investment portfolio. Um, and it also in includes the equity earnings from the, our cable TV operations. Uh, in terms of investment earnings, uh, we're, we're seeing some challenges in terms of potentially meeting, meeting that target only from the perspective that the Federal Reserve continues to uh, support growth in the economy by uh, pushing down interest rates and buying back treasuries. That, that way, what, what that does is actually drives down interest rates in the uh, marketplace and therefore the investments that we make, whether it's buying uh, uh, bonds out there in the open market or investing in Lake and or the San, San Mateo County pool, those, um, um, the interest earnings on those are, are getting pressured as rates in, in the overall climate continue to decline. <coughs> and then move into the top five, if I may, I may on the departmental revenues. And these include uh, police services, um, primarily from traffic fines that we have and also reimbursements uh, from, uh, there's, there's a, uh, actually a grant that we get from the state uh, for $100,000 and then we also get some Prop 172 money from sales tax. So that's the primary contributor in terms of police. And as you can tell by the slide, we're very comparable to the la same level we had last year, $242,000 versus 232 from the prior year. Next largest category for departmental revenues is from the community services department. Uh, that includes our recreation senior center and parks. And we're uh, a little bit ahead in terms of uh, revenue dollars, $23,000 higher than we were previously. And we're at 31% of budget. Obviously there's some seasonality in terms of that department. With the summer, there's recreation programs and aquatic programs and therefore a little bit higher uh, revenues uh, than, than uh, a 25% um, uh, calculation there. Next category is uh, for engineering and, and streets. And those are really um, uh, uh, from gas tax, uh, primarily from the gas tax that uh, the state pays us and uh, from encroachment uh, permit fees that we have. And that's uh, at, right at the 25% mark and uh, uh, coming in you know, kind of on target there. Next category is from the, the planning and building departments, and those are primarily building and inspection fees. There are no new, uh, no large projects that we we projected in uh, for uh, this category of revenues, uh, as we were obviously very conserved in, in building our budgets and and looking at the the dollar amounts were again pretty comparable to the same to, to the last year's level, 187 versus 175, and lastly. Um, in terms of departmental revenues is uh, from the fire department. Uh, those are really from uh, fire inspection fees that we collect and much of that is actually built into the business license renewal process and therefore you see a, a, a very high amount in terms of percentage of budget uh, because the business license renewals takes place at the beginning of the fiscal year. I'll move on to uh, expenditures uh, for the general fund. Um, 
as you can tell, uh, as I mentioned earlier also, uh, we're at 24% of the total expenditure budget. We're about $7.5 million uh, compared to the overall budget of about $31.4 million. Uh, everything is really coming in with, uh, within the budget. There's a couple of uh, departments that are a little bit higher and really it's uh, again the, because of the seasonality of the uh, expenditures. So for instance, in terms of engineering and streets, uh, we made a payment for CCAG for $139,000 that's the full year assessment and so that that's, you know, pushes the total expenditures up a little bit. Uh, the library includes uh, uh, payment, annual payment for the Peninsula Library System uh, for our share costs. So that drives up uh, that department's cost a little bit. But again, overall, we're within uh, the targeted levels. One of the things that uh, the city is obviously mindful of is uh, obviously the Benfield fire. We're continuing to inc incur costs uh, for that incident and obviously we're working hard also to compile the costs for reimbursement from the state and the and federal government mindful of the fact that there potentially would be some costs of the city we were not able to fully recover from all the available uh, resources out there I'll move on to special revenue funds and that's primarily the redevelopment agency uh, again, the anomaly in terms of revenues for both the operating fund and the low and moderate income fund is really from the fact that the, the revenues are from the tax increment re uh, that's generated from, from the uh, property tax bills and therefore we don't see those revenues until again the latter part of the calendar year and uh, April, May of the following year. In terms of expenditures, uh, obviously within targets with, with those levels. We'll move into uh, onto the internal service funds. There are primarily uh, four internal uh, service funds, the self-insurance, the building facility maintenance, uh, garage, and the technology. Because these are internal service funds, do we uh, accounting-wise, we just charge them proratively, and therefore it's at 25% of all the revenue categories. Uh, the only anomaly in terms of expenses is in the self-insurance. That's because we pay the insurance premiums up front in July. Uh, and, and therefore there's, there's that spike in the beginning of the year. I'll move on to the enterprise funds, uh, four major enterprise funds, cable television, wastewater, water, and the stormwater funds. Uh, and again, looking at the overall percentages, uh, they're all within li in line. And again, with the, uh, some of the other revenues I talked about earlier, the stormwater assessments is actually part of uh, the property tax bills and therefore no dollars have been received uh, and we don't expect that out, out, uh, again until the December uh, month when, when we get our property tax revenues from um, the county. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. This is uh, an informational report. Uh, any questions that the uh, city council has, I'll, I'll, I'll take them right now. Any questions? I noticed that uh, you were using as a baseline for last year the initial approved budget, not the budget that we ended up with at the end of the year. And that, the, that budget was a lot larger, which would mean the percentages would be smaller. Mm -hmm. And so if we, if we were to look at that, it kind of makes it look like we're, if we're looking percentage-wise the same as last year, we're actually doing not so good because we know that last year those percentages or, or, I mean, they didn't work out at the end of the year. And knowing what we know about, um, ex well, I mean, we, we can estimate, we can imagine what, um, <clears throat> what the, the costs related to the Glenview fire are gonna be. So we know that there's a variance there that we need to account for. Yeah. We know last year that we had uh, one-time contributions to the budget that aren't gonna be there this year or probably aren't gonna be there this year. So given all that, it sounds like we're probably not in great shape. Yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously, again, it's only one quarter worth of results. Uh, while there are some positive signs in terms of revenues that I talked about, uh, it's still important for staff to continue to monitor our expenses and make sure that you know we're uh, you know spending within our limits there. Uh, and and uh, you know, Glenview continues to be a major concern for us. Uh, there's a lot of expenditures and a lot of work to be done. Uh, for for that particular incident, and so I, I'm certainly not conveying to the city council that you know we're out of the woods by any means in terms of uh, what's going on. Overall, economy and uh, unemployment is still very very high. Uh, there are some economists out there that still that are thinking that 
the unemployment rate is going to remain high until t 2014 uh, because you know, there are just not enough uh, signs from, from the experts that tell us that you know, there's going to be a lot of you know, rapid growth uh, overall. So it's, it's certainly something that uh, I, myself, am, am, am very conscientious of, and, and even though uh, you know, we're <coughs> into October, and we're actually not, quite, not that far away from starting to think about the next year's budgets and any significant adjustments that you know, we may have to uh, account for between now and you know, January uh, of next year, uh, mm -hmm. when we meet again to talk about you know, the, uh, the, the results of the six months period. So uh, your point is well taken in, in terms of you know continuing to monitor the uh, you know uh, the, the situation for both revenues and expenditures. Okay. Any other questions, Irene? Thank you. I, are we keeping track? Are you keeping track of all the Glenview fire expenditures in a separate accounting uh, system? Yes. Or is it okay? Yes. Uh, we create a special fund. Uh, the emergency disaster fund specifically for perp for that purpose so that we can monitor all the costs associated with the uh, with the incident with the disaster okay so our say in January might we hear a report about that too and how it affects everything or is that too soon um, we can certainly include that as part of our report uh, to the City Council in January to give you an update on uh, what the expenditures are for for you know for that particular fund for the disaster? Okay. Absolutely. I, I for one would like to see that. Thank sure. you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Now we'll go to F. Adopt a resolution approving first quarter budget amendments uh, for the 2010-2011 general fund, special revenue funds, and an enterprise funds budget adopted budget. Thank you. Uh, this is a review of the uh, budget amendment, oh, actually a, a presentation of the budget amendments for the first quarter. Uh, so I'll go over uh, them pretty quickly. Uh, for the general fund, uh, the, there's a couple of adjustments for the revenue side of it. Uh, the, shortly after we adopted the budget, we made a change uh, and, and made a transfer in from the state library fund so that we can pay for the library part-time hours. So what you see really on the, on the top of the slide is the revenues coming in from the State Library Fund and obviously increasing the budget for the part-time salary. So, you know, the $22,000 on top and the $22,000 on the bottom, if I may, kind of the debits and the credits, uh, the spending and, and the, the receding of the, of the revenues. Uh, the next item there in terms of reimbursement of police services uh, study is also an accounting item. Uh, we had not accounted for the reimbursement for the city of Millbrae and also the associated costs for the share cost sharing of the study and therefore uh, we have the revenues and the expenditures for that amount uh, uh, to be adjusted uh, for our budget. And then lastly in terms of the revenues for the general fund, we uh, enter into a new contract with, Next, with Nextel to uh, update a site rental uh, for cell phone tower and that actually helped improve our revenue picture, uh, expected revenues, uh, by about $12,000. And then uh, if I go on the, on the appropriation side, the very last item, uh, the city council authorized uh, the, the recruitment for the city attorney, and there's some costs associated with that for, uh, for $20,000, and therefore the adjustment uh, for that amount to the general fund. Other funds. Um, just to talk about the uh, disaster, um, City Council uh, authorized appropriations for some geotechnical and structural engineering services for $84,000 and also some security services for the Glenview area for $108,000. Those were all uh, presented to the City Council during the first quarter. And then lastly, some um, uh, uh, expenditure items for the water fund and the wastewater fund. Uh, there was a purchase of seven water tank mixers that were approved by City Council and also uh, wastewater metering study was approved for $65,000. So those were the uh, adjustments uh, that were reviewed by City Council and some internal adjustments that uh, the staff is uh, recommending for the first quarter uh, for uh, the city's funds. So I'll take any questions in terms of adjustments. Uh, budget amendments to, to the chair so you've, you've listed the two two items that we've 
the two expenditures for as a result of the Glenview fire. That's correct. So there has been no other expenditures from the actual disaster as far as uh, 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 first responders or uh, or other other cities or other agencies or anything. There's been no no. Yeah, no, uh, there, there obviously have been expenditures. Uh, in terms of first responders, not only have we incurred expenditures, there's obviously mutual aid expenditures that we're, we're compiling. Okay. In fact, we, we sent out um, uh, recently a request to all the mutual aid agencies to provide us and so that we can collect all of those first responder costs so that we can submit the claim to the state and for the FMEC grants uh, that was approved. So uh, absolutely, these these only identify specific uh, actions from the city council in terms of things that came to forward came forward to you for for authorization. But absolutely, there are there are many more expenditures that's been accumulating in this fund that I just identified, and it sounds like it's something that uh, the city council would like to see when I do the next quarter's yeah. presentation. Thank you. If I could just add, the finance director indicated earlier that, there, that these are only the costs that were incurred through or, the, or amendment amounts that were approved by the city council through September 30th. There have been, uh, and in particular, there was uh, authorization at the last council meeting in a, much, uh, in a significant amount that will be reflected in the next quarter's um, the reports, and we can certainly provide uh, cost uh, <coughs> information to the City Council prior to your January meeting. That's probably a little bit longer than you might really want to wait to get a, a sense of, of what our costs are to date. But as the Finance Director indicated, we are actively in the process of compiling those costs mm -hmm. at the current time. Any other questions on item F? We need some action. Through the Chair, I'd like to adopt the resolution <coughs> approving first quarter budget adjustments. Aye. Council Agency Member Salazar. Aye. Council Agency Member O'Connell. Aye. Vice Chair, Vice Chair Medina. Aye. Mayor Chair Blake. Aye. In item G, we have two resolutions. Um, adopt a resolution number one, amending 2010-11 general fund, special revenue funds, and enterprise funds budget to reappropriate 2009-10 carryover encumbrances from reserve for encumbrances. And number two, Amending the San Bernardino Redevelopment Agency 2010-11 budget to reappropriate 2009-10 carryover encumbrances from reserve for encumbrances. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a, a part of a new item for the City Council. Uh, it, it's something that we do uh, in, in, in the accounting world. Um, what happens is during the course of year, the city enters into various contracts uh, with vendors and. Sometimes these contracts are not expended it's in, in its entirety during the course of the fiscal year. So the unexpended amount are uh, encumbrances that we carry forward and set aside and reserve against fund balance so that when they do get expended in the subsequent uh, fiscal year, we actually have that money set aside. Uh, so what we do in, in terms of an accounting perspective is that we add onto the budget these encumbrances and it's not new uh, monies that the city council is adding from, from the perspective of new expenditures for the current year, but it was really monies that we've, have, we've earmarked from the prior year that we're using to pay for the current, year, uh, current year's uh, unexpended uh, commitments. So uh, with that, we've identified for the, general, well, for the city uh, $265,000 worth of these encumbrance carry forwards divided up into the various funds. The details of that is actually provided in your staff report as the attachment, kind of in a line item uh, basis. But looking at it from the fund perspective, there's $152,000 from the general fund, uh, $4,000 plus in the solid waste uh, recycling fund, and then for some of the enterprise funds. Uh, the other uh, amounts of carry forwards are identified on the slide before you. Uh, so again, in aggregate, it's two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. If there are any questions it, it, pertaining to any one of the items that are itemized on the staff report attachment, I'll, I'll be happy to answer those. 
Any questions on the item? Action on item number one. I'll introduce the resolution. Council ACC Member Iberra. Aye. Council ACC Member Salazar. Aye. Council ACC Member O'Connell. Aye. Vice Mayor, Vice Chair Medina. Aye. Mayor, Chair Duane. Aye. I guess we need to do two separately. That's correct. Uh, the second one is for the redevelopment agency for 126343 in aggregate. Same reason. Any action? Do it again. Introduce the resolution. Aye. Agency member Salazar. Aye. Council agency member O'Connell. Aye. Vice Mayor, Vice Chair Medina. Aye. Chair Mayor Ruane. Aye. Item number 11, <coughs> report of commissions, boards, and committees. Uh, there are none tonight. Item number 12, comments from council members. Through the chair. No, go ahead. Vice Mayor. Um, it's my understanding that back when the disaster struck that um, with Station 52 being within the vicinity of the devastation, that it was also um, given monies as its neighbors, the households. And I know that's been deposited, as my understanding, into the account that is separate, if that's correct. And my thought was, if it's uh, permissible with the council, is to have those monies look toward possible reinvestment into Station 52. Sort of monies we hadn't thought we were going to receive. Um, a suggestion I would have, based on some of the information I had heard back on from that evening, was maybe uh, air conditioning. Our two fire stations have no air conditioning. Mr. Vice Mayor, just a clarification. Yeah. Receive monies from? Uh, PG&E. right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, PG&E monies. Um, this, uh, during the disaster, it was used, since it had a generator, in order to have folks that came there to get treatment or to have a shelter. It also was utilized to have our personnel go back and try to rehab. And obviously, it's not always hot in San Bruno, but when it is, and you're trying to rest and recuperate, um, I think that's very challenging. So with Council's approval, maybe we can ask staff to bring back the, uh, just a, a thought of that for AC uh, at Station 52, and if there's uh, monies left over, maybe we can look toward it being utilized at Station 51 uh, as far as having AC for, for those facilities. Is that all right with the Council? Through, through the chair, not to negate what you said, I, I have no idea, first of all, how much money was given. 15000 Okay. The, the other thing I'm thinking, I would feel more comfortable if the firemen and staff from that station tell us what they would like. And, and maybe they would like air conditioning, but maybe there's something else they would like or would need or whatever. So incorporate That's those. why I want staff to bring that back. So I'm sure they can talk to the folks okay. that they need to. So, so in essence, have staff come back and tell us what they would like to, done with the money. I'm just throwing out a suggestion <laughs> of one opportunity. If staff has uh, these visions and other thoughts and opportunities that may exist, uh, that after talking with staff or department head, then I'm sure they'll bring those forward as well. Okay. Is that right with everybody? Yeah. You have sure. a consensus? Do you have some direction? Thank you. Okay, through the chair. Yes, Irene. I, I would just like to announce that in, uh, usually in October, in the first meeting of October, we have the beautification awards. Uh, because of the changeability of our scheduling of council, regular council meetings, I decided to postpone those and I would like to have that resurrected on November 23rd, the council meeting before Thanksgiving. I thought it would be appropriate to give thanks not only for all the other things that we do have, but also to recognize the people in San Bruno that have their, uh, submitted their applications for beautification awards and did indeed win, so. Great. Okay, so okay. Um, there you go. That's what Anyone we're going to do. Michael, <laughs> uh, one comment. I wanted to see if um, if the council would be interested in maybe having uh, the city staff give us a presentation on any uh, lessons learned 
from uh, our experience with the fire and if there's anything that uh, we should be concentrating on things that maybe didn't go well. Um, I, I know that city staff has been probably uh, extremely busy dealing still with the fire, but uh, there might be some value in uh, going through that exercise while things are still fairly fresh in everyone's minds and we can document um, things that we believe we did well and maybe some things that we can improve on. We got the same request from a number of city councils up and down the peninsula, so that's, that's good. All right, anything else? All right, item 13, we're going to go into closed session. The city manager and human resources director request a closed session pursuant to California Government Code section 54957.6 regarding direction for labor negotiations with the public safety mid management and police bargaining units. Item number 14, we will adjourn this meeting, and we won't have anything to report. We will adjourn this meeting. Uh, on the, uh, to November 9th, right here at the Center Center.